everybody, and thank you for listening to this reading of two O. Henry short stories with some commentary. There will be some ambient music in the background. The first story is titled Gift of the Magi, and is a story of a wife and a husband sacrificing for each other in order to give each other a wonderful Christmas. The second story is titled Confessions of a Humorist, and is a story of a bookkeeper turned comedian. Both stories will touch on how a certain disposition can lead people down a path that will inevitably help them find joy and love in life. There will be commentary after each story, and in the description there are timestamps if you wish to skip to any particular part. And with that, I hope you enjoy these stories, my friend. The Gift of the Magi One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. And sixty cents of it was pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation and parsimony that such close dealings implied. Three times Della counted it. One dollar, eighty-seven cents. The next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl, so Della did it which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage of the sound, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at $8 per week. It did not exactly beggar description, but it certainly had that word on the lookout for the mendicancy squad. In the vestibule below was a letter box, which no letter could, would go in an electric button which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid $30 per week. Now when the income was shrunk to $20, though they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest unassuming D, but whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with a powdered rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only $1.87 with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. $20 a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only $1.87 to buy a present for Jim. Her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him. Something fine and rare and sterling. Something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier glass between the window of the room. Perhaps you had seen a pier glass in an $8 flat. A very thin and very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, being slender, had mastered the art. Suddenly, she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within 20 seconds. Rapidly, she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now, there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day to dry, just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him pluck at his beard from envy. So now, Della's beautiful hair fell about her, rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knees and made her almost a garment for herself. And then, she did it up again, nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket, on went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with a brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Sophroni, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran and collected herself, panting. Madame, large, 
too white, Chili hardly looked at the Sofroni. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said Madame. Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the mass with a practiced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings. Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by meticulous ornamentations, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew it must be Jim's. It was like him. Quietness and value. The description applied to both. $21 they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the 87 cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it in the sly on account of the old leather strap that he used to place it on the chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way to a little prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love, which is always a tremendous task. Dear friend, a mammoth task. Within 40 minutes, her head was covered with teeny close lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror long, carefully, critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he takes a second look at me, He'll say I look like a Coney Island choir girl. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and 87 cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his steps on the stairway down on the first flight and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit for saying little silent prayers about the simplest everyday things. And now she whispered, Please, God, make him think I'm still pretty. The door opened and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow. He was only 22 and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door. As immovable as a setter at the scent of a quail, his eyes were fixed upon Della and there was an expression in them he, she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with a peculiar expression on his face. Della wriggled off the table and went for him. Jim, darling, she cried, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I've got you. You've cut off your hair? Jim asked laboriously, as if he had not arrived at that patent fact yet, even after the hardest mental labor. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? I'm me without my hair, ain't I? Jim looked around the room curiously. You say your hair's gone, he said, with an air of almost idiocy. You needn't look for it, said Della. It's sold. I tell you, sold and gone, too. It's Christmas Eve, boy. Be good to me, for I went for you. Maybe the hairs on my head were numbered. She went on with a sudden serious sweetness. But nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim? Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly awake. He enfolded his Della. For ten seconds, let his regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight dollars a week or a million a year. What is the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it on the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell, he said. About me, I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or shave or shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. 
white fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper. And then an ecstatic scream of joy. And then, alas, a quick feminine change of hysterical tears and wails, necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the lord of the flat. For there lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped long in a Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell, with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them, without the least hope of possession. And now, they were hers. But the tresses that should have adorned the coveted ornaments, adornments, were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and smile and say, My hair grows fast, Jim. And then Della leapt up like a little singed cat and cried, Oh, oh. Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her palm. The dull precious metal seemed to flash with the reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it dandy, Jim? I hunted it all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time at a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, said he, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get money to buy your combs. And now, suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you may know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplications. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasure of their house. But, in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. O oh, all who give gifts and receive gifts, such as they are the wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. Now, the first question is, how much is the dollar eighty-seven worth currently? The story was published way back in 1905. Adjusting for inflation and time, the dollar eighty-seven would be worth approximately sixty-five dollars today in 2024. Della's hair would be worth roughly seven hundred dollars. You could get a pretty good gift with seven hundred dollars. That's like two PlayStations right there. Of course. In the story, I think the real gift was the thought. In much of life, especially with the people you care about, I find that the thought tends to matter significantly more than anything else. Though there is always the desire to give something the receiver would truly want. This story has been retold and parodied countless times in various places, including film, television shows, cartoons, video games, and even several operas. Personally, I only remember an episode of Futurama that spoofed the story with Zoidberg, but some other places in recent memory you might have seen a retelling it could be shows like Family Guy, Phineas and Ferb, or The Rugrats if you're old like me. It's even been in video games like Honkai Star Rail. Interestingly enough, there are parallel stories that are similar but don't have the same moral or takeaway. In particular, I think of an episode of The Twilight Zone where in that episode, a man that loves reading ended up in a situation that gave him plenty of time to read and plenty of books, but he broke his glasses, so he was not allowed to read, or couldn't read even if he wanted to. It's, and the only real similarity there, I guess, would be that it's the same sort of sacrifice to give something wanted, only for it to serve no practical purpose. Though, I think in that story, it was the issue was the guy wasn't paying attention to anything else going around him, so it wasn't really coming from the same place. And granted, the man losing his glasses wasn't gifted ample reading time and infinite books by a significant other. I think it was like a bomb or something that killed everyone else. Another tangent here about this story could be to make fun of the fact that this loving couple has no communication skills. Although I feel like this is a common thread among people in general, where you plan out something awesome for somebody you care about, uh, only to be sidestepped by the reality of ulterior motives and other things that are just not communicated or talked about. And, you know, that's the risk you take when you make a surprise. But whenever they go off, it's awesome, isn't it? So really, it could be said that the element of surprise is what actually thwarts all parties involved here. 
But that discussion can be had at another time. Let's move on to the next story. Confessions of a Humorist There was a painless stage of incubation that lasted 25 years, and then it broke out on me, and people said I was it. But they called it humor instead of measles. The employees in the store bought a silver ink stand for the senior partner on his 50th birthday. We crowded into his private office to present it. I had been selected for spokesman, and I made a little speech that I'd been preparing for a week. It made a hit. It was full of puns and epigrams and funny twists that brought down the house which was a very solid one in the wholesale hardware line. Old Marlowe himself actually grinned, and the employees took their cue and roared. My reputation as a humorist dates from half past nine o'clock on that morning. For weeks afterwards, my fellow clerks fanned and flamed on my esteem. One by one, they came to me, saying what an awfully clever speech that was, old man, and carefully explained to me the point of each of one of my jokes. Gradually, I found that I was expecting to keep it up. Others might speak sanely on business matters and the day's topics, but for me, something gamesome and airy was required. I was expected to crack jokes about the crockery and line up the graniteware with persiflage. I was second bookkeeper, and if I failed to show up a balance sheet without something comic about the footings, or could find no cause for laughter in an invoice of plows, the other clerks were disappointed. By degrees, my fame spread. I became a local character. Our town was small enough to make this possible. The daily newspaper quoted me. At social gatherings, I was indispensable. I believe I did possess considerable wit and a facility for quick and spontaneous repartee. This gift I cultivated and improved by practice, and the nature of it was kindly and genial, not running to sarcasm or offending others. People began to smile when they saw me coming, and by the time we had met, I generally had the word ready to broaden the smile into a laugh. I had married early. We had a charming boy of three and a girl of five. Naturally, we lived in a vine-covered cottage and were happy. My salary as a bookkeeper in the hardware concern kept at distance those ill attendant upon superfluous wealth. At sundry times, I had written out a few jokes and conceits that I considered peculiarly happy, and had sent them to certain periodicals that print such things. All of them had been instantly accepted. Several of the editors had written to request further contributions. One day I received a letter from the editor of a famous weekly publication. He suggested that I submit to him a humorous composition to fill a column of space, hinting that he would make it a regular feature of each issue if the work proved satisfactory. I did so, and at the end of two weeks he offered to make a contract with me for a year at a figure that was considerably higher than the amount paid me by the hardware firm. I was filled with delight. My wife already crowned me, in her mind, with the imperishable evergreens of literary success. We had lobster croquets and a bottle of blackberry wine for supper that night. Here was the chance to liberate myself from drudgery. I talked over the matter very seriously with Louisa. We agreed that we must resign my place in, at the store and devote myself to humor. I resigned. My fellow clerks gave me a farewell banquet. The speech I made there cursicated. It was printed in full by the Gazette. The next morning, I awoke and looked at the clock. Late by George, I exclaimed, and grabbed for my clothes. Louisa reminded me that I was no longer a slave to hardware and contractor supply. I was now a professional humorist. After breakfast, she proudly led me to the little room off the kitchen. Dear girl, there was my table and chair, writing pad, ink, and pipe tray, and all the author's trappings, the celery stand full of fresh roses and honeysuckle, last year's calendar on the wall, the dictionary, and a little bag of chocolates to nibble between inspirations. Dear girl, I sat me to work. The wallpaper is patterned with arabesques or odalisks, or perhaps it was trapezoids. Upon one of the figures, I fixed my eyes. I bethought me of humor. A voice startled me. Louisa's voice. If you aren't too busy, dear, it said, come to dinner. I looked at my watch. Yes, five hours had been gathered in by the grim scytheman. I went to dinner. You mustn't work too hard at first, said Louisa. Gote? Or was it Napoleon? Said five hours a day is enough for mental labor. Couldn't you take me and the children to the woods this afternoon? I am a little tired, I admitted. So we went to the woods. But I soon got the swing of it. Within a month, I was turning out copy as regular as shipments of hardware. And I had success. My column in the weekly made some stir. And I was referred to, in a gossipy way, by the critics as something fresh in the lines of a humorist. I augmented my income considerably by contributing to other publications. I picked up the tricks of the trade. I could take a funny idea and make a two-line joke of it. 
earning a dollar. With false whiskers on, it would serve up cold as Cotrain, doubling its producing value. By turning the skirts and adding a ruffle of rhyme, you would hardly recognize it as verse de society. With neatly shod feet and a fashion plate illustration, I began to save up money, and we had new carpets and a parlor organ. My townspeople began to look upon me as a citizen of some consequence, instead of the merry trifler I'd been when I clerked in the hardware store. After five or six months, the spontaneity seemed to depart from my humor. Quips and droll sayings no longer fell carelessly from my lips. I was sometimes hard run for material. I found myself listening to catch available ideas from the conversations of my friends. Sometimes I chewed my pencil and gazed at the wallpaper for hours trying to build up some gay little bubble of unstudied fun. And then I became a harpy, a Moloch, a Jonah, a vampire to my acquaintances. Anxious, haggard, greedy. I stood among them like a veritable killjoy. Let a bright saying, a witty comparison, a piquant phrase fall from their lips, and I was after it like a hound springing upon a bone. I dared not trust my memory, but turning aside guiltily and meanly, I would make a note of it in my ever-present memorandum book, or upon my cuff for my own future use. My friend regarded me in sorrow and wonder. I was not the same man. Where once I had furnished them entertainment and jollity, I now preyed upon them. No jest for me ever bid for their smiles now. They were too precious. I could not afford to dispense gratuitously the means of my livelihood. I was a lugubrious fox praising the singing of my friends, the crows, that they might drop from their beaks the morsels of wit would, that I coveted. Nearly everyone began to avoid me. I even forgot how to smile, not even paying that much for the sayings I appropriated. No persons, places, times, or subjects were exempt from my plundering in search of material. Even in church, my demoralized fancy went hunting among the solemn aisles and pillars for spoil. Did the minister give out the long meter doxology? At once I began doxology. Soctology. Soctologer. Meter. Meet her. The sermon ran through my mental sieve, its precepts filtering unheeded. Could I but glean a suggestion of a pun or a bon mot? The solemnest anthems of the choir were but an accompaniment to my thoughts as I conceived new changes to ring upon the ancient comicalities concerning the jealousies of sopranos, tenor, and basso. My own home became a hunting ground. My wife is a singular feminine creature, candid, sympathetic, and impulsive. Once her conversation was my delight, and her ideas a source of unfailing pleasure. Now I worked her. She was a gold mine of those amusing but lovable inconsistencies that distinguish the female mind. I began to mark those pearls of unwisdom and humor that could have enriched only the sacred precincts of home. With devilish cunning, I encouraged her to talk. Unsuspecting, she laid her heart bare. Upon the cold, conspicuous, common, printed page, I offered it to the public gaze. A literary Judas, I kissed her and betrayed her. For pieces of silver, I dressed her sweet confidences in the pantalettes and frills of folly and made them dance in the marketplace. Dear Louisa, of nights I have bent over cruel as a wolf above a tender lamb, hearkening even to her soft words, murmured in sleep hoping to catch an idea for my next day's grind. There's worse to come. God help me. Next, my fangs were buried deep in the neck of the fugitive sayings of my little children. Guy and Viola were two bright fountains of childish, quaint thoughts and speech. I found a ready sale for this kind of humor, and was furnishing a regular department in a magazine with funny fancies of childhood. I began to stock them as an Indian stalks the antelope. I would hide behind sofas and doors, or crawl on my hands and knees among the bushes in the yard to eavesdrop while they were at play. I had the qualities of a harpy, except for remorse. Once, when I was barren of ideas, and my copy must leave in the next mail, I covered myself in a pile of autumn leaves in the yard, where I knew they intended to come to play. I cannot bring myself to believe that Guy was aware of my hiding place, but even if he was, I would be loath to blame him for setting fire to the leaves causing the destruction of my new suit of clothes and nearly cremating a parent. Soon my own children began to shun me as a pest. Often, when I was creeping upon them like a melancholy ghoul, I would hear them say to each other, Here comes Papa. And they would gather their toys and scurry away to some safer hiding place. 
miserable wretch that I was. And yet I was doing well financially. Before the first year had passed, I had saved a thousand dollars, and we had lived in comfort. But at what cost? I'm not quite clear as to what a pariah is, but I was everything that it sounded like. I had no friends, no amusements, no enjoyment of life. The happiness of my family had been sacrificed. I was a bee, sucking sordid honey from life's fairest flowers, dreaded and shunned on account of my sting. One day a man spoke to me with a pleasant and friendly smile. Not in months had the thing happened. I was passing the undertaking establishment of Peter Heffelbauer. Peter stood in the door and saluted me. I stopped, strangely wrung my heart by this greeting. He asked me inside. The day was chill and rainy. We went into the back room, where a fire burned, and a little stove. A customer came, and Peter left me alone for a while. Presently, I felt a new feeling stealing over me, a sense of beautiful calm and content. I looked around the place. There are rows of shining rosewood caskets, black palls, trestles, hearse plumes, morning streamers, and all the paraphernalia of the solemn trade. Here was peace, order, silence, the abode of grave and dignified reflections. Here on the brink of life was a little niche pervaded by the spirit of eternal rest. When I entered it, the follies of the world abandoned me at the door. I felt no inclination to rest a humorous idea from those somber, stately trappings. My mind seemed to stretch itself to grateful repose upon a couch draped with gentle thoughts. A quarter of an hour ago, I was an abandoned humorist. Now I was a philosopher full of serenity and ease. I had found a refuge from humor, from the hot chase of the shy quip, from the degrading pursuit of the panting joke, from the restless reach after the nimble repartee. I had not known Heffelbauer well. When he came back, I let him talk, fearful that he might prove to be jarring note in the sweet, dirge-like harmony of his establishment. But no, he chimed truly. I gave a long sigh of happiness. Never have I known a man's talk to be as magnificently dull as Peter was. Compared with it, the Dead Sea is a geyser. Never a sparkle or glimmer of wood marred his words. Commonplaces as trite and as plentiful as blackberries flowed from his lips, no more stirring in quality than a last week's tape running from a ticker. Quaking a little, I tried upon him one of my best pointed jokes. It fell back ineffectual, with the point broken. I loved that man from then on. Two or three evenings each week, I would steal down to Heffelbauer's and revel in his back room. That was my only joy. I began to rise early and hurry through my work, that I might spend more time in my haven. In no other place could I throw off my habit of extracting humorous ideas from my surroundings. Peter's talk left me no opening, had I besieged it ever so hard. Under his influence, I began to improve my spirits. It was the recreation from one's labor, which every man needs. I surprised one or two of my former friends by throwing them a smile and a cheery word as I passed them on the streets. Several times I dumbfounded my family by relaxing long enough to make a jocose remark in their presence. I had so long been ridden by the incubus of humor that I seized my hours of holiday with a schoolboy's zest. My work began to suffer. It was not the pain and burden to me that it had been. I often whistled at my desk and wrote with far more fluency than before. I accomplished my tasks impatiently, as anxious to be off to my helpful retreat as a drunkard to get to his tavern. My wife had some anxious hours in conjecture where I spent my afternoons. I thought it was best not to tell her. Women did not understand these things. Poor girl. She had one shock out of it. One day, I brought home a silver coffin handle for a paperweight and a fine, fluffy hearse plume to dust my papers with. I love to see them on my desk and think of the beloved back room down at Heffelbauer's. But Louisa found them, and she shrieked with horror. I had to console her with some lame excuse for having them, but I saw in her eyes that the prejudice was not removed. I had to remove the articles, though at double quick time. One day Peter Heffelbauer laid, me, laid before me a temptation that swept me off my feet. In a sensible, uninspired way, he showed me his books and explained that his profits and his business were increasing rapidly. He had thought of taking in a partner with some cash. He would rather have me than anyone he knew. When I left his place that afternoon, Peter had my check for the thousand dollars I had in the bank, and I was a partner in his undertaking business. 
I went home with feelings of delirious joy, mingled with a certain amount of doubt. I was dreading to tell my wife about it, but I walked on air, to give up the writing of humorous stuff, once more to enjoy the apples of life, instead of squeezing them to, pull, to a pulp for a few drops of hard cider to make the pubic feel funny. What a boon that'd be. At the supper table, Louisa handed me some letters that had come during my absence. Several of them contained rejected manuscripts. Ever since I first began going to Heffelbauer's, my stuff had been coming back with alarming frequency. Lately, I had been dashing off my jokes and articles with the greatest fluency. Previously, I had labored like a bricklayer, slowly and with agony. Presently, I opened a letter from the editor of the Weekly, with which I had a regular contract. Checks for the Weekly article were still our main dependence. The letter ran thus. Dear Sir, as you are aware, our contract for the year expires with the present month. While regretting the necessity for doing so, we must say that we do not care to renew same for the coming year. We were quite pleased with your style of humor, which has seems to have delighted quite a large proportion of our readers. But for the past two months, we have noticed a decidedly falling off in its quality. Your earlier work showed a spontaneous, easy, natural flow of fun and wit. Of late, it is labored, studied, and unconvincing, giving painful evidence of hard toil and drudging me mechanism. Again, Regretting that we do not consider your contributions available any longer, we are, yours sincerely, the editor. I handed this letter to my wife. After she had read it, her face grew extremely long, and there were tears in her eyes. The mean old things, she exclaimed indignantly. I'm sure your pieces are just as good as they ever were, and it doesn't take you half as long to write them as it did. And then I suppose Louisa thought of the checks that would cease coming. Oh, John, she wailed. What will you do now? For an answer, I got up and began to do a polka step around the supper table. I'm sure Louisa thought the trouble had driven me mad, and I think the children hoped it had, for they tore after me, yelling with glee and emulating my steps. I was now something like their old playmen as of yore. The theater for us tonight, I shouted. Nothing less than a late, wild, disreputable supper for all of us at the palace restaurant. Lumpity diddly dee 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 dum! And then I explained my glee by declaring that I was now a partner in a prosperous undertaking establishment, and that written jokes might go hide their heads in sackcloths and ashes for all me. With the editor's letter in her hand to justify the deed I had done, my wife could advance no objection, save a few mild ones based on the feminine inability to appreciate a good thing, such as a little back room in Peter Heff, no, of Heffelbauer and Company's undertaking establishment. In conclusion, I'll say that today you will find no man in our town as well liked, as jovial, and full of merry sayings as I. My jokes are, again, noised about and quoted. Once more, I take pleasure in my wife's confidential chatter without a mercenary thought, while Guy and Viola play at my feet, distributing gems of childish humor, without fear of the ghastly tormentor who used to dog their steps, notebook in hand. Our business has prospered finally. I keep the books and look after the shop, while Peter attends to outside matters. He says that my levity and high spirits would simply turn any funeral into a regular Irish wake. These sort of first-person tellings are the kind of stories I enjoy the most. I think they're one of the easiest ways to get someone's perspective clearly and usually concisely. Of all the things that could be taken away from this story, my attention is mostly called to a curious anomaly that occurs in entertainment. The person who is on one, being told they should remain on one, and even turning it into a career. It is cool to see a story about how a natural proclivity turns into an activity that must be farmed to exhaustion and treated as a resource to be extracted at any cost to fund existence. Usually this type of story is told differently. For example, uh, let's imagine the story is about an athlete that's really good at baseball. The story will only be told and reflect on how that athlete gets better at baseball and how their identity is formed around baseball and how when they can no longer play baseball they feel diminished and remember the glory days hopefully replace the athlete with anything fisherman chef deep sea welder scientist and imagine stories you've heard that are told this way everyone notices they're uh, good at something and encourages them to pursue it and usually with some hard work and determination it's happily ever after after that meanwhile in this story the man is plagued and drained, trying to constantly do the thing with no break, and much worse, everyone expects him to be funny at all times. All of this, which turns him into a ghoul of sorts, 
always prowling about and taking and taking and taking any humor to be found in anything anyone says. The cure for the situation being meeting someone who's greatly indifferent and in stark contrast to everyone else in terms of expectation and an ability to fuel the habit and the character acknowledging the peace afforded by it. In particular, I liked his dancing around the table when the letter informed him he was fired, or rather his contract wasn't extended. No longer a slave to the joke, allowed to just jest for fun and keep books as he'd previously enjoyed. I think in modern times the story has become relatable, probably to more people. With the rise of social media turning every venture into an experiment and practice and growth metrics and performance, that allows comparison to expand from, you know, just yourself in a mirror to the entire world. Your next joke needs to be better than your previous, and the one after that even grander, and so on. There's a curious thing that happens when hobbies turn into occupations, though I don't think it happens the same for everyone. The curious thing, I believe, is the reframing of the relationship with said hobby. For some people, it could be a quirk of personality or a way to relax, while others feel extreme passion towards a hobby. Enough so that there's an indifference if it turns into work or whatever. In the case of joy or merrymaking, I think it isn't often examined what goes into that, or the cost of it. Well, at least not without common tropes about it, like, think, uh, the people that smile the biggest are often the saddest, stuff like that. Keep from going to some dark place. I encourage you to think of someone in your life who is like the humorist. I've had a few at various jobs. Usually it's a dad joke guy. They keep things lighthearted. They add a quip here and there, and they have that smiling energy about them that feels like it's just a part of their existence. Fairly effortless, it seems like. The crazy part is, they are always just doing some random thing at wherever they are. An account manager, the janitor, backo operator, ice cream cone guy, a truck driver. They have all these other skills. All of those things, but they just bring a humor and joy to life, seemingly expecting nothing in return, like a natural habit. In the story, I liked that there was a contrast that when his joke writing process became quick and easy, it was not worth anything to publications. I speculate on that part a little. Was it the jokes became too formulized, or was he just burning through all of life's material at a rapid pace because he was putting all his energy into it all at once rather than, you know, parsing it out over a lifetime? Or was it because he was trying so hard that he lost his natural edge? Whatever the case, it feels sort of relatable with all things we're good at to an extent. I think it's possible to train and improve some skills, but the ones where we are already maxed out, perhaps analyzing them sort of breaks them apart or provides diminishing returns quick because it's exhausting. Well, I've rambled long enough here. I hope you enjoyed. See you next time.